Well, good morning. Sorry, I was talking and didn't notice the countdown timer. So, welcome. We are glad you're here to worship with us this morning. It is always good to gather together as the body of Christ and to remember uh, Jesus' resurrection from the dead and what uh, the church has been celebrating on Sundays for uh, thousands of years. And so it's good to gather and be a part of that. Uh, If you're here for the first time, we're glad you're here and and want to say thank you and welcome you uh, for being with us this morning. And we have a card on the little podiums over there if you would fill that out. We have a gift we'd like to give you as a thank you for being here. You can just take that to the Welcome Center outside and we'll give you that gift. And then also we want to remind you that those cards are not just for visitors, but if you're here and uh, maybe you've been coming for a while, but you small groups at 9 a.m. Uh, just let us know on those cards and we'd love to plug you in uh, where we think you would think well, where you, we think you would fit well, um, or you're welcome to just try out several. Um, but uh, uh, use those cards for that and also use those cards to share prayer requests with us so we can be praying specifically for you throughout the week. Okay? Now, a few things coming up. Uh, first is that we're doing a uh, mission project down in L.A. Uh, Easter week at the beginning of that week. And if you're interested in going that it's we're going to be working with uh, Bethany Baptist Church in Bellflower and it's uh, something that the entire family can go to if you're interested in more information about that trip uh, there's a meeting right after church today uh, over in the 300 rooms and I know some of you are saying but I can't stay today right after church because the 49er game starts at noon <laughs> I won't say anything about your um, but if, if, you're, if you can't make it today, just uh, grab Pastor Craig at some day. He has some time. You can call him, shoot him an email, um, but he'll be able to give you that information, give you the details of that. So if you can't make it today, um, be sure to grab him, and we uh, look forward to that. Uh, the other thing I want to let you know about is that on February 5th will be our business meeting in Potluck. And so we come, we gather, we eat, and then we talk about what's been going on in the church and what will be uh, moving forward. The big thing uh, for this business meeting is we're looking to add two men to our pastoral leadership team. And so those two men are Jeff Brotnov, who's right here, the guy looking around. Um, He's going to do our call to worship a little bit later, and then Dave Darval, and they're not here this morning because they're sick, but we'll vote on them at that meeting, but we want to put these men before you now. So if there is a concern that you have or some reason you think that they would not be qualified for that, please come let us know, either myself or somebody else on the leadership team. Um, and then at the business meeting, you'll get to hear their testimonies, and then we'll vote on them. Um, Next is uh, sign up for women's book group. If you're uh, interested in being part of the book group, they meet once a month. It's a great way to just grow in friendship uh, with other people and grow in the Lord. So if you want some more information, you can go right over there after the service. And then the last thing to let you know about is next Saturday, we're going to try to clean up the campus. So I want to say thank you to uh, Drew and Danny and Rob Colum. They've been cutting things. Um, So if you notice all of the debris laying around the campus, they've been working on that. And next Saturday, we're going to try to clean that up at 8 a.m. So we will have a chipper. And so it's just fun putting stuff in a chipper if you've never done that before. Um, But also, uh, if anybody has like a big trailer so we can move stuff around, uh, we would love to um, have your use of that. So if you could talk to Drew. Drew, can you wave? Um, If you have a big trailer you could bring, that would be really helpful to us as well. And it'll be just a... Um, there's something fun about working together. So um, if you can come help us with that, we would love to do that. All right. So those are the things going on in the church. That's kind of the business things you need to know about. Um, And now I'm going to invite Jeff and he's going to call us to worship. Good morning, church. Ah, Good. Okay. Um, Our call to worship, part of it comes from Psalm, I'm, I'm sorry, Isaiah 55. And then keep your fingers there. And the second part of it comes from John 4. So, Isaiah 55, starting with verse 1, it says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Hearken diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in fatness. And then jump down, jump down to verse 6 where it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 
And then God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But, but keep your finger on verse 1, and we jump over to John chapter 4, where Jesus says, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. The water that I will give him shall become in him a well, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so we see how the first part of this is fulfilled in the Gospel of John, which is really cool. Anyway, so let's pray. Lord God, thank you for today, and thank you for all the different things that you do for us, and thank you that we, we, we can come to you, and we can be pardoned, and we can find salvation, and we can find joy, and we can find peace in you. We lift the service into your hands, Lord. Help us to be the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Amen. All right, well, let's, uh, let's stand. Thank you, Jeff, for uh, doing call to worship and playing bass. We're going to put as many hats on him as we find out. He'll be a pastor leadership team member soon. We'll give him a janitor's uniform as well. All right, well, let's worship this morning. <laughs> let's sing about how every day is sweeter to be with the Lord. Amen. One, two, three. Can you take a seat? And then little kids, if you're all the way up until sixth grade, if you guys want to come up here, so sixth grade and younger, Eli, I know that's you, you're mine. And the rest of you, yeah, come on up. We're going to stand right over here, follow Mr. B, and we're going to watch a baptism this morning. So all the little kids, come on up.
of God's grace and mercy through his son, Jesus Christ. Morning, everybody. Morning. So I'd like to tell you uh, a little about myself. So uh, my life before becoming a Christian and walking with God and what it led to today in my baptism. I grew up in a big family knowing, you know, the life of drugs, alcohol. All my parents divorced at around 10 years old. I experienced a lot of trauma in my life and neglect with my family members. At an early age of 13, 14, I started experiencing using drugs, alcohol. Never consist with, with it being, uh, but did, did it from time to time. Moving on in my teenage years, I graduated high school, started college. At this time, about a half a year into college, I ended up having a child and at this time, I wasn't even focused in college. I was more focused on using drugs and drinking alcohol. When I found out I was having my firstborn, Isaac, I made a choice to work full time and try to provide for my family. At this time, we ended up getting married at the age of 19. Through this marriage, I, was, I ended up starting uh, heavy drinking and using drugs. Years passed, and we ended up divorcing divorcing each other. Through this marriage, I ended up uh, causing more trauma to myself with jealousy and anger. So after the divorce, I tried to do well for my firstborn, but it didn't, very, it didn't last very long. It only led to using uh, partying and using heavier drugs. I thought it would help, help, me, lose, uh, help me with losing weight and other, other things that I had personal issues with. <laughs> and also help, help me uh, feeling more confident about myself. Me thinking I would be able to just stop and, uh, at any time and, and, and of using drugs took me, took me to leading to me to, uh, to make horrible decisions in my life. I lost a lot. I lost my job, ended up um, addicted to drugs. At the end of the path, I was working, uh, I started working for Walmart. Uh, I was working at Walmart for four years, ended up finding this amazing person in my life, Melissa, which I'm married to now. With Melissa, I came, with Melissa came um, two beautiful kids, Phoenix and Cole. We ended up together uh, a couple months before we ended up pregnant with our firstborn, Luke. This led us to making a decision of getting married and blending our families together. We've been married going on eight years now but together 10 years. Through this marriage, I, have, I haven't been perfect. I've never been, I, sorry. Um, haven't been a, a perfect man she always seen me for. In August of uh, 2022, my wife finally seen me for who I was. I love my wife very much. I knew in my heart the Lord didn't want me to end my marriage and wanted me to try with all my heart to keep my marriage together. I knew the only way I was going to restore this marriage was through, through God. So one day, I called my brother, my best friend, Ricky, asked him if me and my family can join him at church. Something was telling me to go in and I, that I needed prayer. And I knew God can help me through this mess I created for myself and my family. It was in August, uh, August 27th when I text my brother, and August 28th is when I came, met up with him, um, with my brother at church, with his family. And August 28th was when my life changed for the best. I asked Jesus to forgive me and gave, me, gave myself to the Lord and Savior. He, he forgave me. I felt so blessed in my heart when I came to Jesus. He gave me so much love, like no other unconditional love. It was perfect. Christ forgave me for all my sins, and I knew that I could never turn away from him in my life. I chose to be a Christian and walk with the Lord, with Lord God, for the rest of my life. When I started living for him, he has helped me with my pain, fear, confidence, and also how to be vulnerable. It's not an easy road. He deserves to be put first in my life. I will, give all, I will give my all to God and praise him daily for what he had continued to do for me and my family. He continues to bless me with my wife every day as 
we focus on him. He has blessed my family with coming to church and putting him in our lives and making him a focal point in our household. This is my testimony, and I, and I, I'm, I'm becoming the man I'm supposed to be in God's eyes, and I know I have a purpose in this world. He will provide that purpose when he knows I'm ready. That's my testimony, guys. I'm just so thankful, as Darren and I were talking before we came out here, of just seeing how the Lord was at work, and, and, and Melissa, and Ricky, and, and then the church, and, and influencing him. I remember sitting down and talking with, with uh, JR about the gospel, yep. and we're talking it through. He's like, I know this, I know this, and when we tired to talk about faith, what it means to trust in Christ, he got all excited. It's like he almost jumped out of his chair. He's like, that's what I did. He's like, I've always known these things. Yep. But I finally trusted in him, yep. and that's what I did. I'm like, when did you do that? A couple weeks ago at church. I'm like, well, praise God. <laughs> and so, uh, so let's, uh, why don't you come over here, and uh, we're going we're gonna to baptize you now. So, JR, because of your profession of faith and, and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the name of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let me, uh, let me pray. Father, I thank you that you are a God that saves, that you are a God that redeems. Lord, that we do destroy our lives by our sin. We destroy everything around us by the choices we make in our rebellion against you. But Lord, you are a God that in your grace, in your mercy, sent your son, Jesus Christ, to live that life that we never could and die to pay that penalty for our sins so that we could experience the life and the forgiveness that, that JR just testified about. So we give you thanks and praise. Father, I pray for JR, Lord, as he would, would continue now in this walk of following his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, that you would be continually at work in him and in his marriage to Melissa and in his, as a dad to his kids, Lord. And Father, that you would continue to be, to be glorifying yourself through the new life that you have given him. Father, we give you thanks and praise. Father, we thank you that we can worship along with him, Lord, as we celebrate the saving work that you did in him and the saving work that you did in our lives. Father, and maybe the saving work that you would do for those this morning who still have may not made that decision to place their faith in you. Father, we thank you that we get to worship in this way and that we continue to worship, that we pray that you be glorified in the giving of our offerings and the worship of our, our songs and the worship as we study your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Would you guys stand with us as we continue in worship? This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad. Weather the sun. Weather the sun will shine. Weather the skies will rain. I know that you are good. This is the day you made. Whether in life or death, whether in joy or pain, I know this truth remains. That this is the day you made. This is the day that the Lord has. As we lift his name, this is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Now I can walk, now I can walk in faith. You will protect my way, your every work is good. And this is the day you've made. I am a child of yours. You are the one who saves. I am redeemed by love. And this is the day you made. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has Sing your praise for the Lord now reigns on the throne of grace. Soon is a day he will bring us home, and we have this hope for we are his. Sing that again. This is a day. Come and sing your praise. Rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day. The Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Whether the sun will shine, whether the skies will rain, I know that you are good. And this is the day. Oh uh-huh. 
you could be seated and children first, second, and third grade are dismissed for Adventure Club. You know, when somebody is baptized, uh, nothing magical happens. Um, we get to hear their story. But there's something about the proclamation of, of your faith before a group of people. And JR now has an obligation to live what he has proclaimed in, in front of you. Um, and so I hope you will pray for him in that. Um, and I say that not to put extra pressure on JR, but the flip side of that is because he has opened himself up to you to share and shared his story and said, I desire to follow Jesus, you as, our, as his church, uh, us as a church family have an obligation to him to, to not only pray for him, but to lovingly come alongside him to encourage him in his faith. And so, you know, baptism is neat because it's, it's, this coming together where we get to hear one another's stories, but it's this reminder of the obligation we have to one another to follow Jesus together. And so I hope that if you haven't met JR this morning and his wife, Melissa, that you'll uh, seek them out uh, either this morning or in the weeks to come and let them know that you're praying for them and are excited uh, to walk with them through their faith or with their faith. All right. So um, if you would open your Bible to First Timothy chapter 6. And we continue our study in the book of 1 Timothy. Um, when you get sick, what do you do? Do you go to WebMD? Do we have WebMD people here? They go, I, I see a few hands that are willing to admit that. Um, doctors are not huge fans of WebMD. It can be a useful tool, but sometimes it can make people more worried than they need be. And sometimes WebMD makes people not worried when they should be. Um, and diagnosing your own sickness can be kind of difficult because your own personality gets involved. Um, some of us are optimistic. Some of us are pessimistic. Uh, some of us are hypochondriacs. Um, I have a friend that, I mean, every time he gets sick, he's convinced he has all kinds of things that he finds on WebMD. And then um, some of us wouldn't go to the doctor unless we were unconscious and our wife called the ambulance, right? <laughs> Um, our, and so diagnosing our, our own sickness is, is often difficult, and we need that outside person to step in and say, here are the symptoms. Uh, we need to go to regular checkups and have the doctor say, okay, here's where you need to be better in your health. And in our passage this morning, what Paul is doing is Paul is diagnosing for Timothy uh, what health is in the Christian life, but also where there is sickness with the false teachers. As we've gone through 1 Timothy, we've seen that Paul is warning Timothy and charging him to call out the false teachers and say, you need to stop, stick to the gospel. And so what we see this morning is, is uh, Paul doing this diagnosis. So if you would, look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I'm going to read the last little bit of verse 2, and then down through verse 10. Paul writes, teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils." It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. This is God's word for us this morning. It's perfect, it's holy, it's infallible. Let's pray. God, we pray that as we look at your word, you would use it to pierce our hearts, to shape us, Lord, to be more like you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. As Paul writes to Timothy, he doesn't want Timothy just to be a talking head, just somebody that is communicating information to his church, he is to teach and urge these things. He's not just to teach so that the church grows in knowledge. He's to urge the church to grow in their love of Christ, to pursue 
Jesus Christ, to follow him together as a church. And when different uh, doctrines come up, the very first thing that Paul charged Timothy to do was to set things in order, right? To stop the false doctrine, to stop that teaching. He says in uh, chapter 1, verse 3, I urged you to charge certain persons not to teach a different doctrine. So Timothy is to stop people from teaching different doctrine. But how does Timothy identify the different doctrine? Are, Are there things that he can help, that will help him to diagnose and things that he can look to as warning signs? What are the What does Paul warn him that these false teachings can lead to? And so that's what Paul's doing here. But he begins with the definition of health in verse 3. He says, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teachings that accord with godliness, and then he goes on. So he gives us the definition there. So he's to look for people who are not teaching what is sound. And sound, it means something that's healthy, something that's solid, something that's firm. Um, Paul is giving here a a picture of what health is and what is unhealthy. And we have to know what is healthy as a church. We have to know what it is we're holding fast to. And so Paul gives two complementary things here that describe health. The first thing he says is the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the teaching. So what is healthy is what Jesus Christ has taught. His words. And so Paul is basically saying you stick to what Jesus has revealed. You stick to who he is. And so just quickly, um, go back to John chapter 6. And I just cherry picked some, some passages. But really, we could go pretty much anywhere in the Bible. But in John chapter 6, verse 67... It says, so Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And I put that first because Peter is recognizing there that Jesus has the words of eternal life. In John three sixteen, Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people have loved the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. And then you go to chapter 11, verse 25, and Jesus again here speaks and he says and I'll start in verse yeah verse 25 and Jesus said to her I am the resurrection and the life whoever believes in me though he die yet he shall live and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die and then he asks do you believe in me and then John 14 6 Jesus makes it very clear he says I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me And so throughout his ministry and life on earth, Jesus was giving the words of eternal life. He was calling sinners to repentance and saying and pointing them forward to what he was going to do. And the words of Jesus that we must hold fast to are the fact that every person that has ever lived is is a sinner and has fallen short of God's glory and is doomed for an eternity separated from God in hell. But through Jesus Christ, God has provided a way for us to escape that to be saved from that. And that's why we use that language of salvation. When we simply come and say, Jesus, I believe, I know that I am a sinner and I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Please forgive me. You are forgiven. And that's what J.R. gave testimony to this morning is that time where he finally said, God, I, I, I'm going to follow you and trust you for salvation. And so we think of the words of Jesus, but we're not thinking just of the red letter words in our Bible. In 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so the Bible as a whole is God's word. This is Jesus' words. This is what we hold to. This is what makes us healthy is when we live by this book. So then that brings us to the second thing. He says that we are to... um, 
So what is sound is the words of Jesus Christ and the teachings that accord with godliness. Well, what is godliness? Godliness is right practice. It's that which is healthy and sound. It's taking what you know from the Bible and applying it in action that is consistent with what the Bible teaches. It's application and action that is consistent with genuine faith or genuine belief that what God says is true. Sometimes we know what is true. We say we believe something, but we don't follow through with it. I know in and out is bad for me. I know it's unhealthy, but I love in and out So do I really believe in and outs unhealthy? Yeah. <laughs> we shouldn't be uh, about God. We're all in. Do I really believe that what God says in his word is true? And do I live that way? And so when we talk about godliness, that's what he's talking about. Living a life that is consistent with what God's word says And in 2 Peter 3.16, Peter writes, and he warns that ignorant and unstable people will twist God's word to their own destruction. People will take God's word and they'll, they'll twist it. They'll, rather than say, what does God's word say and how do I conform to it? They take what they believe and try to conform God's word to meet their desires. And that's not good. That's not healthy. And it happens all of the time. What is the definition of health? A healthy life believes and obeys the word of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible. A healthy life believes in Jesus for salvation. A healthy life relies on Jesus and follows him in obedience. A healthy life trusts Jesus for our hope of the future and eternal life. That's what a healthy life does. So that's the healthy life. That's the definition of health is following Jesus' words and his teaching and and acting in a way that accords with that or is consistent with that. What are the symptoms of an unhealthy life? And Paul gets into that in verse 4. He says first that this false teacher is puffed up with conceit. And we know that swelling is always the sign that that something's wrong in the body, right? And he gives this picture of of swelling with conceit or swelling with pride. Um, The lexicon gives a great picture of what conceit is. This is the definition it says. It says conceit is to be deceived, to be in a haze. To be or become deceived about the reality concerning oneself, especially one's own intelligence and superiority. This is a great picture of, of what pride and conceit is. Is that a person that is, lives so in the haze and the fog of their own greatness and majesty that they don't see the world the way it really is. And, and conceited and prideful people are annoying, right? I, I got an amen. I would remind you what I heard one time is pride is the easiest sin to see in somebody else (laughs) and the hardest sin to see in our own heart. And we have to always remember that. And so conceit is not healthy. It's a symptom of something that that is wrong. So there's, there's conceit. And then it says that he understands nothing. The fog of their own greatness doesn't allow them to see the world the way it really is, and it doesn't allow them to hear God's word. And, and the pride causes him to speak as if he is an authority on everything when, when he's not. And uh, an example of this, pa- Pastor Connor had shared a story with me one time, and I asked him to, to uh, share it with me again so I could use it as an example. But uh, if you don't know, Connor uh, grades for California Baptist University. He's been doing that for about six years. And there's a professor there that he is the grader for. And this is the opening sentence of a paper that he graded some years ago. This is what the student wrote. The Greek word for psalms is septuagint, which in English means 70. There's nothing true in that sentence. (laughs) The Hebrew word psalms means song, and if you, the Greek version of that also means song, Septuagint means 70 in Greek, and the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. But he's writing this as the opening sentence of his paper, as if this is what my whole paper is going to be built on. And he presents himself as an authority, and to which Connor just, I'm not sure, I have to, I don't remember how he responded to that, but it's like nothing in that sentence is true. 
And Peter had said that you know, people are going to twist God's word. And so we see this pride and this understanding of nothing. And it says that it leads to unhealthy cravings. And, and we live in a half fast food world, so I don't think I need to illustrate unhealthy cravings. Um, I already used it in and out as an example. But what are these unhealthy cravings? It's, it's a craving for controversy and quarrels about words. And Paul brings up the same thing in 2 Timothy, that there's this controversy and quarrels. These people cra- crave these things. And because they understand nothing, they get caught up in, in these arguments that, that are about nothing. And I know I shared, I think a couple months ago, when I was in Alaska uh, last summer, if you don't know, I spent about 10 days in Alaska with the Athletes in Action baseball team, and I drove a van around full of college baseball players. And in one of our van rides, they got into an argument over whether there were more doors or wheels in the world. And in, in, it, was the, it was the entire 15-minute van ride, and then they brought it up at dinner with the entire team, which led to this whole debate of, well, what do you consider doors? What do you consider wheels? And, and it just, it was 30 really funny yet really painful minutes as they, and it's just like, this is a totally fruitless, and they understood that, and it was funny, but it's like, that, that's a meaningless controversy, and then I think about all the, the conferences and books and videos that people write trying to identify the day, the day that Jesus will come back, when scripture specifically says we're not to know the day, but yet people will spend so much time trying to say that's it. I remember being terrified in high school because somebody said he was coming back the year I was supposed to graduate. And I thought, oh, no. (laughs) I wasn't very mature at that time. (laughs) But there's so many things that people can get wrapped up and and caught up in. And healthy, good theological debate, it's good for our soul. It's good to explore the deep things of God. But we have our deep theological debates with an attitude of grace and kindness and humility, seeking to know and understand God's word, not just a fight with our church members. The false teacher loves to stir the pot. They love to get people arguing, and that's just not what is healthy in the church. So what does this unhealthy life produce in the church? Paul gives us a list here. He says it produces envy, which would be jealousy, resentment, or spite, it presents, produces dissension, which is bitter conflict and just fighting. And um, it produces slander, abusive, which is abusive speech, false words designed to destroy a person's reputation. It um, produces evil suspicions, accusations and thoughts without evidence where you become suspicious of everybody and you don't trust anybody. He says that it produces a constant friction So consistent irritation and rubbing. And just imagine you go to the beach and you get sand and all those places you don't want it. And then you have to go and walk several miles. The constant friction will drive you crazy. And in some cases, that constant friction will cause you to give up the walk. When you see these symptoms in a person or in a group of people in the church, the the diagnosis is, is to look at their heart and what, what Paul goes on and say, writes here to Timothy. He says, when you see this, or if you see false teachers, this is what you can expect in them. But he goes on, he says that in verse 6, in constant friction among people who are depraved of mind and deprived of truth. They're depraved of mind. They're lacking integrity and unright, unright, unri- uh, uprightness, and they're, they're loving what is unrighteous and what is evil. They're deprived of truth. They, they, they're rejecting God's truth and they're choosing to follow something else. And they imagine that godliness is a means of great gain. And basically what he's saying there is they're saying, you know, that they're saying that if they live like a Christian, it's going to be a means for them to gain. And then he's going to go on and talk about money. So basically he's saying, you know what, there are people there that think that their involvement in the church is a great way to get rich. They think their actions will save them. They think piety will gain them favor before God, and it doesn't. And there are churches who claim to be following Jesus, but because they are led by false teachers, they they look like this. They fight and quarrel over words. They're full of envy, dissension, slander, evil. They're in constant friction. They reject the truth of salvation by grace alone, through Christ alone, and they teach salvation by works. 
And you will see this demonstrate a lot. If, if you've ever watched anything about a cult and when it breaks up, you will see this kind of stuff. But unfortunately, there, there are also times where a church isn't necessarily a cult. And I've had a couple times in my life where I've heard from somebody that was an insider in a church. And um, one specific instance I can th- think of, and, and the leadership of the church was just rotten to the core. And adultery, extortion, theft, and blackmail were just a normal way of life among the leadership of the church. And do you think that church was healthy? No. It, it went on for a little while, but then eventually it just it exploded and just did a lot of harm. We don't want to be like that or become like that. So we have to be about what is healthy, right? Which goes back to verse 3. We have to be about the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and teaching that accords with godliness. And so as we follow Jesus Christ together, we point people to God's word, we hold one another to God's word. We don't hold them to what we think is right. We say we'll hold them to what God's word says. And we constantly point one another to Christ. And doctors will tell you that to be healthy, you have to eat right and exercise, right? We eat God's word. We dine. We feast at God's word. And we exercise our faith through living out God's word. That's how we remain healthy. That's how we grow in health. So what does the healthy life look like? What is the practice of a healthy life? Look at verse 6. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And that's really the key thing there. What does the healthy Christian life look like? It's content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Again, godliness is belief and actions consistent with God's word and character. And the first act of godliness is placing your faith in Jesus Christ, believing that you are a sinner and that he died on the cross for your sin. That's the first thing. That's the first act of obedience Jesus asked for from you. And then contentment is trusting God's sufficiency in everything, trusting that he will satisfy. Godliness with contentment is believing and living, knowing that Christ is sufficient for everything you need and that he will satisfy you for eternity. Do you believe Jesus is all you need? Is Jesus your only hope in life and death? This godliness with contentment is great gain. And I thought, well, what what do we gain as Christians? And there's so many different places in the Bible we could go to look at what we gain as Christians. And so I just went to my favorite chapter in the Bible, which is Romans 8. And I'm not going to read the entire chapter. I I would encourage you to read it later and just think, what what do we gain through salvation? But here's what I came up with, and this is my, my paraphrase or summary of the truths laid out in Romans 8. If you have placed your faith in Jesus, this is what you get. You're free from the condemnation of sin. You're made righteous, which you would never be able to do on your own. You get the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, You have the ability to say no to sin. You are adopted by God. You become an heir of everything that is God's. You get a confident hope or assurance of a future with Jesus for eternity. You get the Spirit interceding for you. You get God working to make you more like Christ. You are foreknown, predestined, called, justified, and you will be glorified, and nothing can change that process. God is for you. And when you doubt that, this is what Paul says. He says, if God is for you, who can stand against you? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And there are times in our life where where we, we doubt God's love for us and think, God, how could you allow this to happen? Or how could you put this in my life? Or Life's just hard, God. Do you love me? And Paul is basically saying, when you doubt God loves you, think about the fact that he sent his son to die for you. What greater evidence of God's love could we ask for than that? Back to Romans 8, you gain the reality that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Those are the promises from one chapter in the Bible. And yet... Scripture is filled with those promises for those that love him. Are you satisfied with that? 
Are you content in that? Paul says in verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And I think that for, for us as Christians living in a fallen world, not being perfect yet, the world offers so many things and says, this will satisfy, this will bring you joy. And we have to say, no, it won't. It's going to come up short and I'm going to be satisfied with God. That's the battle with sin, real simple right there. Will I be satisfied with God or am I looking for satisfaction somewhere else? So he says that godliness with contentment is great gain. And then verse 7, 4, or because this is why we should be content with God. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. And what my grandpa used to always love to say is you've never seen a hearse pull in a U-Haul. <laughs> we don't get to take anything with us, right? You can spend your whole life collecting stuff. And it's all going to stay here. You can, get, you can spend your life collecting stuff, and in 10 years, it's out of style. <laughs> right? You build your big, beautiful house, and you go modern, and then in 10 years, nobody's building those anymore. To seek, we need to be seeking to gain Christ, be content in Christ. He's the only thing that will never leave us wanting. And I'd like to, this is my favorite definition of faith. This is from a pastor named David Haig. He says, faith is believing that what God has for you through obedience is better than what the world offers through sin and selfishness. That's being content in God. Faith is believing that what God offers through Obedience is better than what the world offers through sin and selfishness. Are we content in Christ? So we're to be content because we can't take anything with us. And then in verse 8, he says, if you have food and clothing with these things, be content. He's like, just be content with the basics. You don't have to be fancy. And then verse 9, he begins to talk about the desire to be rich. And if we desire that, we fall into temptation and, and it's a snare it reminds me of James 1.14 when it says each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. And he goes on and says that those desires are what give birth to sin. And that, that lured and enticed, it's a fishing term. And it's the pictures. There's something dangling out there. And you're like, oh, that looks so good. But inside there's a hook. And it's going to catch you. It's going to ensnare you. We're lured and enticed by this desire to be wealthy because we think that, that wealth can fix everything. But Paul says godliness with contentment is great gain. You could say it's, it's really the greatest gain because nothing else offers what Jesus Christ offers. There are a lot of things asking for our hearts and riches is just one of those things that, that pull at us because we think if I just had more money, I could fix everything. I won't ask how many of you have a list of what I would do if I won the lottery. We think it would fix everything. But unfortunately, we know just from you know, famous people that being rich doesn't often come with contentment. But Christ gives us everything we need. And Paul goes on and he, he just warns about this. He says that it's a snare and it, it's a snare, and it leads people to what is senseless and harmful decisions, and it plunges people into ruin and destruction. And so you get this picture of just being sunk in who God is or in, in what riches is. And he says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. He's, it's not the root. It, money is a neutral thing. And he'll, down in verse 17, talk about what a rich person should do with their money. But it is a thing that can snare us and entice us, and it can pull us into all kinds of evil. And to crave money, is, it will lead us to destruction if we don't do it holding fast to God's word and being godly. You can't serve God and money. You, you can't do both. And Paul says in verse 10, he says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And then he says, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many pangs. And so I think Paul's just sitting there and he's thinking, I can name person after person that has left faith to pursue money. And it, it hasn't satisfied it. It has led them 
to be pierced with many pangs. And the sad thing is there is it's pierced themselves. It's a self-inflicted wound. The, the love of money is it's shooting ourselves. And we have no one to blame but ourselves. And he uses this picture of pangs. And so Paul here is he's, he's warning, he's saying, you know what, the healthy life is contentment in Christ. And avoid anything else that is going to draw you away. And then I just like the reality of it and be aware that one of those things that is going to pull is money, wealth. Don't think that wealth will make you content. The only thing that will make you content is Jesus Christ. And I know some really wealthy people that are really content in Christ. I know some really wealthy people that aren't. And I know some really poor people that are content in Christ and they're okay. And I know some people that are really poor and they're not content and they're they're miserable. The healthy person, the healthy Christian holds fast to Christ and they're content with him. So let's do a little diagnostic to wrap up. How's your health? All right. Somebody here, I'm sure, is dead in their trespasses and sins. And have you asked Jesus to forgive you and make you alive? And, and if you haven't done that, you can do that right now. I just, just talk to God. Say, God, please forgive me. For those of us that are believers, how's your health? Do you need to work more on the nourishment from God's word? Do you need to dig in more? Do you need to feast on him? Do you need to enjoy him? Do you need to find satisfaction here? And one of those promises from Romans 8 is God will help you in that. Just ask. How's the health of the person sitting next to you? How can you help them? Can you exercise your faith together? Can you grow in Christ together? Can you feast on God's word together can you just tell them about the wonderful meal you just had in god's word i mean too many times we we just come and we we go but we're to gather together as the church to encourage one another to walk in faith together to follow jesus together and then the last question is how's the health of our church it's easy to make all of this about the individual but we need to be constantly diagnosing ourselves as a church Are we healthy? Are we getting caught up in in conceit and pride? Are we quarreling about words? Are we full of envy and dissension and slander and, and evil suspicions? Is there constant friction among people? I don't think so. I think right now we're doing real well. But how do we keep from moving from being healthy to being unhealthy It's we hold fast to God's word and we do that which accords with godliness. That's what we hold fast to. And so as a church, are we following Jesus together? When you do get that friction with somebody else, do you make it right? Or do you let it just rub until you get irritated and raw and angry? As a church, we want to be following Jesus together. So what does it mean to be healthy? It's to hold fast to the teaching of God's word. It's to act in godliness. And it's to be content in Christ. That's my prayer for my own heart, is that I would grow in my contentment in Christ. And that's my prayer for you, that we would be content in Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And God, we thank you for this reminder from 1 Timothy, Lord, of of just how much we can be pulled away from you, Lord, and what, and the dangers of that, the dangers of not holding fast to your word, the dangers of not pursuing godliness. And God, I pray that you would protect our church, that you would help us to diagnose ourselves well, to be honest, Lord, to seek you first. And God, we know that the health of our church is built on the lives of us as individuals, God. So I pray that you would help us to grow in our love for you. God, that you would help us to diagnose our own hearts, Lord, to see where we are being drawn 
to be satisfied in something other than you, Lord, and that you would help us to, to see that the world never lives up to what it offers, God, that sin always falls short and it leaves us unsatisfied and wanting. God, help us to, to desire you more than anything else. Help us to find our contentment in you alone. God, we thank you that you are our salvation, that you are our hope in this life, and God, that you are our hope in death. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. amen. As the band comes, uh, I invite you to just spend a few minutes and, and talk with the Lord. And uh, while we sing, there'll be a few of us up here at the front. If you would like to talk with someone or pray with someone, uh, we would love to do that with you, okay? Would you stand with us as we sing one more song?
standing so we can be dismissed with our benediction from Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go in peace, blessed saints. Every morning I will worship every day.